On this Friday night, Israel calls it a grave mistake. Its findings into the airstrike that killed seven aid workers. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility. And why the UN says the military's problems go far beyond this tragedy. Being wounded is a death sentence. A Canadian doctor returns from the front lines in Gaza. A lot of children going blind. The new fear among his colleagues and his resolve. It's the $30 million question. How did thieves pull off one of LA's biggest heists? I don't understand. What happened to all that money? The Canadian-based company at the center of the case. And a bird's eye view, or a bear's, or a zebra's. Shining a light on what animals will experience during an eclipse. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with an admission of failure by Israel. It is blaming serious errors and breaches of procedures for the attack that killed seven humanitarian workers, including a dual Canadian-American citizen in Gaza on Monday. The strike on the aid vehicles is a grave mistake, stemming from serious operational failures, mistaken classification and identification, errors in decision making, and strikes that were conducted in violation of standard operating procedures. The Israeli military has disciplined at least three officers for their roles in the strikes. But as Jackson Prosco reports in our top story tonight, accusations are growing that Israel isn't doing enough to protect civilians. It was a grave mistake, according to the Israeli military, which blamed its own top commanders for the strike that killed seven relief workers with World Central Kitchen. The IDF investigation found Israeli troops mistakenly assumed armed members of Hamas were traveling in the WCK convoy. They misidentified WCK vehicles, despite the fact they were clearly marked. The IDF says the attack was contrary to standard operating procedures. They were targeted systematically, car by car. World Central Kitchen wants an independent investigation, saying in a statement, the IDF cannot credibly investigate its own failure in Gaza. The United Nations says the problems run deeper than just one incident. But the essential problem is not who made the mistakes. It is the military strategy and procedures in place that allow for those mistakes to multiply time and time again. Israel says it has fired two senior officers and reprimanded a top commander, but the damage is done. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. The U.S. has warned Israel it must change course or risk a change in the U.S. policy of unconditional support. As Israel pursues any military operations against Hamas, it has to prioritize the protection of civilians. It has to make that job number one. A tense Thursday phone call between U.S. President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yielded one major concession. Israel will reopen a major crossing into northern Gaza. I asked them to do what they're doing. The U.S. says it will be watching to see if words are followed by action. It wants a measurable improvement in the amount of aid flowing through to desperate civilians. This time, Israel may have no choice but to make that happen. Its once unshakable bond with the U.S. is now on unsteady ground. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. And the United Nations' top human rights body is calling on all countries to stop supplying weapons to Israel. The resolution is aimed at preventing more human rights violations against Palestinians, including impeding access to water and blocking shipments of vital aid. But it is non-binding. The council also adopted a resolution calling for Israel to be held accountable for what it said are possible war crimes against humanity. The deaths of those aid workers have sent a chill through the humanitarian aid community. Many organizations are re-evaluating their plans and their work in the region. Toronto doctor Yasser Khan had just returned from his second trip to Gaza when he learned of the killings. He says it's a painful reminder that there is no security for anyone in the region. Heather York's West has more. And a warning, some of the content in this story may be difficult for viewers. I mean, I saw things that uh, I'm still horrified by. An experienced humanitarian, Dr. Yasser Khan, has brought his skills in ophthalmology and eye plastic surgery to dangerous and desperate locations all over the world. 
But the situation in Gaza right now, he says, is unlike anything he's witnessed before. It's really horrific injuries that I've never seen in my in my entire life. And and uh, it was horrible to see a lot of damaged eyes, a lot of children going blind. The Toronto physician first traveled to Gaza in December and January. But when he returned to Han Yunus in March to work at one of the only hospitals still functioning in the region, he realized Gaza's fragile health system had all but collapsed. The system cannot cope. Um, uh, infectious disease is rampant. Uh, the sterile conditions of the hospital are gone. In this setting, uh, it's not just the dead. Being wounded is a death sentence because the chance of surviving if you're wounded is extremely minimal. Those not physically wounded are dealing with heavy emotional pain, the grief of so many losses weighing everyone down. Healthcare workers are exhausted, and any illusion of safety is now also gone. Dr. Hahn says the deaths of seven humanitarian aid workers Monday hit hard. As a Canadian, that hit close to home because I did a lot of traveling. That could have been me, basically. That could have been all the doctors, foreign doctors that are there right now. He says among his colleagues and friends currently working in Gaza, there is now a lot more fear. But with that fear, for Han at least, there is also renewed resolve. He will return to Gaza. The people there, he says, cannot just be left to die. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Gaza isn't the only place where aid workers are under attack. In eastern Ukraine, there was another strike overnight in the fighting between Russian and Ukrainian troops. Early today, the offices of MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, in the Donetsk region were bombed and destroyed. No one was killed, though five people were injured. It's not clear who is responsible for the attack. Canada's Foreign Interference Commission has wrapped up a week of hearings that heard new evidence about attempts by foreign powers to interfere in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections. That evidence focused mostly on China and its apparent efforts to tilt the 2021 election towards the Liberal Party. The Prime Minister, however, has been reluctant to answer questions about this new information. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, has been following the proceedings all week. David. Well, Carolyn, we've heard evidence all week about activity during the 2021 election that CSIS believes may have been coordinated by China to defeat Conservatives and help the Liberals. Comments by individual PRC officials. A declassified summary of CSIS intelligence was entered into evidence late Thursday, in which CSIS reported that in 2021, some individual People's Republic of China officials in Canada made comments expressing a preference for a Liberal Party minority government. As soon as they, they heard my Chinese name. Two days ago. A 2021 Conservative candidate, Kenny Chu, testified. Chu lost his re-election bid after a barrage of disinformation was aimed at him. Disinformation that security officials believe may have been coordinated by China. Just to clarify. And the inquiry has also taken note of some CSIS intelligence summaries that China may have been behind efforts to assist some liberal candidates in the Toronto area. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has resisted all week commenting on evidence as it emerged at the inquiry, and he did so again on Friday. I look forward to uh, taking all sorts of questions at the commission next week. And while the inquiry has spent most of the week hearing about China, it has also heard evidence that other countries have also tried to interfere in Canadian political processes, notably Pakistan, Russia, Iran, and, second only to China, India. I think it, it's fair to say that, you know, uh, the, the, the behavior of India has been of concern in the last couple of elections. No evidence has been presented to suggest India or the others favored one party or another in Canadian elections, but CSIS believes all of those countries engaged in covert and clandestine activity to promote their own interests. We've known for many, many years that many uh, different countries take an interest in uh, engaging in Canadian institutions. The clear message from political party officials and politicians who have already testified at this inquiry is that to better protect themselves, they need more information in real time during election campaigns. And we'll see you next week if the Prime Minister agrees. Carolyn. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks. Canada's unemployment rate is seeing its largest jump in nearly two years. 
Statistics Canada says unemployment rose to 6.1% last month, up from 5.8% in February. It's also a full percentage point higher than a year ago. The economy unexpectedly lost 2,200 jobs in several areas in March, including accommodation, food services and retail trade. The losses were driven by a spike in people searching for work with high borrowing costs and strong population growth. Economists say it could be a sign the labour market is cooling, which may take some steam out of inflation and help lower interest rates. South of the border, tech giant Apple says it's laying off more than 600 workers in the company's first major job cuts after the pandemic. The move comes on the heels of Apple's decision to cancel its multi-billion dollar electric car project. State records show the company gave 614 employees in Southern California notice of the cuts last week, with the changes set to take effect at the end of May. A whole lot of cash vanishes without a trace. Coming up, the multi-million dollar mystery in Los Angeles. A rare earthquake centered in New Jersey rattled the nerves of tens of millions of Americans across the Northeast this morning. While small compared to tremors experienced on the West Coast, the magnitude 4.8 quake was felt from Boston to Philadelphia, an area not used to earthquakes. We have not felt the magnitude of an earthquake of this level since about 2011. You cannot plan for this. There's no early warnings. There's no weather uh, service that can tell you an earthquake is imminent. And that's why uh, everybody was caught off guard. There were no immediate reports of major damage or injuries. The quake did trigger a full ground stop at airports around New York, some of the busiest in the country, leading to significant delays. Investigators in Los Angeles are piecing together a daring heist after thieves broke into a money storage facility and made off with $30 million in cash without tripping a single alarm. It happened on Easter Sunday. As Joel Senek reports, a company headquartered in Montreal is at the center of the robbery. From the air, evidence that may be connected to a crime that sounds like a movie script. What's missing from this nondescript money storage facility in Los Angeles has law enforcement working to track down one of the largest cash heists in the city's history. There's no doubt that this had to be an inside job. The robbery playing out like a plot straight from Hollywood. It safeguards every dime that passes through each of the three casinos above it. And we're going to rob it. This real-world heist happened in the L.A. suburb of Silmar on Easter Sunday at the Garter World building on Roxford Road. Sources telling the L.A. Times the burglary crew broke through the roof of the building without tripping any alarms. They accessed a money storage area deep inside the building and left with $30 million. Garter World, a Montreal-based global security company, did not return our request for comment. Every company who's engaged in this business will look for lessons learned on this one. Former law enforcement officers believe it was a sophisticated operation that took a lot of planning. To be able to get into the building undetected, to be able to get into an internal safe, to be able to remove that much property, some knowledge of uh, the alarm system, uh, the layout of the place. To actually finally get to access to the safe, you need the access code, you need the passcode to get in there. Who's going to know that? The LAPD and FBI are not saying much publicly about their investigation. Whatever vulnerabilities there are in the location, uh, time, how many people are working, all of those things will be looked at very closely. Facts that authorities hope will help answer one big question. I don't understand. What happened to all that money? Joel Senek, Global News, Washington. At least 14 people were killed in western Bolivia after a small bus was hit head-on by a semi-truck transporting salt. Authorities say the driver of the salt truck may have fallen asleep and crossed the center line before colliding with the oncoming bus. One child was among those killed, along with nine women and four men. The truck driver, one of the two survivors of the crash, has been taken into police custody. Budget priorities ahead. What Canadians want to see in this month's federal spending plan. Finances are certainly top of mind in Ottawa right now as the government prepares to table its latest federal budget later this month. And new polling by Ipsos, conducted exclusively for Global News, offers a peek into what Canadians want those fiscal priorities to be. 
From the cost of living to climate change, Mackenzie Gray breaks down the findings. It's pretty much all the Prime Minister wants to talk about. The goal of this fund will be to provide more homes faster by scaling up and promoting innovative technologies and materials like modular and prefabricated homes. For the fourth day in a row, a housing announcement. This one putting forward $600 million for four different programs, part of billions of new housing money. Most of it tied to premiers accepting federal demands. So if they don't want to do more in those areas, they don't have to take our money. But if they want to deliver for their citizens, we're saying be ambitious. The Liberal aim to cut rent and house prices, which is most people's largest monthly expense. Bringing down costs, something nearly half of Canadians want the federal government to focus on in the upcoming budget, according to new polling done by Ipsos, for Global News. I think the Prime Minister is really in, in that sort of classic rock and a hard place spot. If you are struggling to find an affordable rental home, then it doesn't really matter to you whether that comes from the municipality, the province, the federal government. You just need your problem solved. The other problems Canadians want solved? Increased health care investments. They'd also like a tax cut. And for the carbon tax to be frozen, something the Prime Minister has consistently ruled out. Canadians are saying that things are just getting too expensive, they can't afford them, and they want the government to address that. Cost of living and the carbon tax, top priorities for Conservative voters. Two issues Pierre Polyev has been pushing since becoming leader, with a specific focus on housing. We have a crisis in this country, and a bunch of recycled, rebranded announcements aren't going to fix the problem that Justin Trudeau created. No matter how much Canadians want everyday expenses to come down, that probably won't happen quickly, regardless of any level of government's actions, Carolyn. But there could be immediate relief next week when the Bank of Canada has its next scheduled interest rate announcement. Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thank you. Recording data in darkness. Next, why researchers are heading to the zoo for next week's eclipse. We're getting our first look at the new championship trophy for the Professional Women's Hockey League. The Walter Cup is named after the Walter family of Los Angeles, which provided financial support for the new league. Designed by luxury jeweler Tiffany's, it features a stylized puck on the bottom, symbolizing a shattering of the glass ceiling. Well, there are just three sleeps left until the much-anticipated solar eclipse. And while Canadians are primed for the event, animals may not have gotten the memo. It's unknown how they will respond to the sudden daytime darkness, which is why a zoo in Quebec is closing its doors on Monday. Mike Armstrong visited the zoo, where research has already started. I'm going to be observing uh, the Asian uh, Himalayan black bear. When millions across North America look up at the sun and yeah, moon Monday, uh, Chelsea Paquette's focus will be on Fong and Canal. She'll be noting every little thing they do inactive behaviors, uh, grooming behaviors, if they're feeding, uh, running or climbing. Uh, and then I also have like playing behaviors, like vocalizations, observing uh, the sky, etc. And this is every minute? Every minute, yeah. The Granby Zoo has chosen 12 species to watch, 50 animals in all, among them red pandas and a community of Japanese macaque monkeys. The zoo will be closed for the eclipse so the animals won't be affected by visitors. Up here, there'll be two people watching uh, the zebras and the ostriches, and that's it. Pierre Chastanet pitched the project to the zoo. He's an astronomer by profession with a passion, he says, for eclipse chasing. Monday will be his fourth. But while he's had to travel as far as Australia in the past, this one's going over his house. He says it'll get dark, the temperature will drop, and winds will pick up, and he wants to know how animals react. It's another way to, by looking at their behavior during the eclipse, to try to understand what's happening in their head. I find the animal behavior even more interesting than what's happening with the sun. Dr. Adam Hartstone Rose is running a similar study out of a zoo in Texas and collaborating with Granby. But he also has some experience from the 2017 eclipse. His team found about 25% of animals observed showed signs of anxiety. Giraffes ran around during the eclipse and a Komodo dragon suddenly started climbing the walls after for two days not moving. I wasn't 100% convinced it was still alive until the totality. 
they probably feel that something is wrong. While some animals may feel anxious, others may just end up disappointed. When it starts getting dark, some might think it's their feeding time, and nocturnal animals might think it's time to wake up. But experts don't know much more than that. Heartstone Rose says there are more scientific studies about Sasquatch than about animal behavior during an eclipse. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Granby, Quebec. And to learn about how to safely observe Monday's eclipse and what to expect when it happens, go to our website, globalnews.ca. And that is Global National for this Friday night. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. Tonight's Your Canada is the Merchant Mariners Memorial in Sydney, Nova Scotia. We love seeing your Canada. Please keep emailing your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope you'll join us again tomorrow night. Have a great night.